Um, so what I thought I would do is my introduction to polymer science was actually, so this is a photograph here of um, Kurt Frisch, who some of you may know, he was at the University of Detroit in the Polymer Institute. So my mother actually worked there. So I would, um, as a young child, I would be exposed to these um, different kinds of foams and polyurethane foams. And I thought too, Sergey, this is something we had talked about, um, the early beginnings of polymer science, especially in, I know the Czech Republic, right, was, um, uh, the contact lenses. So I thought it was interesting. I discovered, you know, last night, but then my mother actually has a patent on, on this and it has to do with the polyurea um, and polyacrylic, um, you know, interpenetrating networks. So I just thought um, to share with you that po polymers have always kind of been in my life. And so um, what I thought I would do is first give you a brief background. I'm go going to talk more about the applications, um, although I, I have to say, um, so my, my laboratory is very interested in kind of the intersection of three different areas, the fundamentals of cell biomaterial interactions. In other words, how can we use different properties of hydrogels or different kinds of um, polymeric scaffolds, whether they're natural materials or, or synthetic and controlling the phenotype um, and the behavior of cells. And then we build them into tissues. And so this is one example actually using thermoresponsive polymers, which was dis discussed in the previous talk, we can use thermoresponsive polymers to make cell sheets and stack them and make patches of tissues, or we can use um, degradable um, natural polymers as well. But then we also use this um, framework using, um, for example, PDMS, polydimethylsiloxane, to form models where we can look at um, different kinds of uh, cancer metastasis, looking at how cells interact with each other. But the area I'm going to really talk about today is the um, area of theranostics where we're looking at nanoparticles and, and microbubbles. Um, and so just to, to do that, I'm going to tell you three short stories. One has to do with enhanced oil recovery, um, and uh, the second has to do with calcific valve disease, and then finally talking about abdominal surgical adhesions. And for each one, I will touch on the different kinds of areas. So for example, the first story has to do with iron oxide um, nanoparticles, which can be used for magnetic resonance imaging. And the, the focus here I really want to talk about is nanoparticle aggregation, where we look at um, molecular theory and, and experiment and how theory can predict what the behavior will be. So let me first just jump right in and tell you that the reason why we were very interested in, in this study is that actually um, for enhanced oil recovery, as, as you may or may not know, two out of every three drillings are very unsuccessful. This is basically because you're going blind into the, into the um, downhole. So you do not have any um, knowledge of what the kinds of materials that you're pumping in. So um, Schlumberger, as, as well as others, have developed um, a kind of inside, flipped inside out um, magnetic resonance imager. So you can actually have the, um, the instrument go down, down hole. So the idea is be because also, um, actually this number 50%, it's even been shown to be higher, more like 70 or 80% of the oil remains down hole. So what we really want to know is to, to determine detailed chemical content. And so that's like the spatial um, uh, location, you know, interact, interaction with the different rocks. And so we'd like to understand that. And in order to do that, um, creating these, these agencies um, um, using these super paramagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles, some of the things you would like to do is you'd like to have a narrow um, nanoparticle size distribution. So what that means is you need to be able to control the synthesis quite well. Um, the coding is really where it's at. So you need to be able to um, prevent aggregation of the nanoparticles. So one of the um, strategies we decided to do was to have an anchoring group. So you were, are only functionalizing single nanoparticles. The other point is that this is very high temperature and um, high salinity environments that, that's actually um, happening in the ground down hole. So the American Petroleum Institute has this um, recipe of this brine, it's called API brine. So it has a lot of calcium in it and um, a lot of high salt. And, and we'll see in a minute why, that, why that's important. And so what you really wanna have is high affinity bonding between the polymer and the nanoparticle core. 
The other point too is really um, to controlling the high surface energy of these singly dispersed nanoparticles. So then the surface um, coating, the, the density of the number of chains is very important as well. And then in, in terms of economics as well too, if you're then trying to create a bunch of these um, nanoparticle agents, you really wanna have the minimum amount of polymer necessary to achieve um, uh, the, the, the minimization and the aggregation. So to do that, if we just take a look at colloidal forces, everybody knows, right, that you have Van der Waals attraction, right? You, so these will then, um, if you have two particles that are interacting, right, the Van der Waals forces are driving them together, which you can see in this um, combination of the different forces, but you also can have steric repulsion to kind of counteract that. And then depending on the, the, what the surface charge is or the charge, you know, the, the, the stern layer or the outer Helmholtz plane, right, you, you have the electrical double layer. And, and uh, as I mentioned to you already, this is API brine, which was it's just it's a highly um, negatively charged um, medium. And so in order to, to look at that, um, what people have done in the past is that they've looked at um, different kinds of iron oxide clusters. And what they tend to do is they use these copolymers which are, um, you know, polyamps and, um, you know, acrylic acid. But the problem with these is that you have multiple um, components. You have, uh, you know, multiple clusters of these iron oxide, which are very difficult to model as well, right? So if you don't know how many particles that you have per polymer, right, it, it becomes very difficult. And so, um, I mean, certainly there, ha there has been some um, some great progress in this in terms of like controlling you know the size we really wanted to um, address having singly modified nanoparticles and so um, the strategy we um, decided to do is like I mentioned um, we really want to have the chemical structural um, consistency and that is because if you're getting this NMR signal from down hole if you want to be able to distinguish between the chemical components of the of the oil, um, you really want to be able to um, get, get around the um, the background noise and and all the kind of um, signal that will um, the bad kind of extra noise you will get from unwanted aggregation. So colloidal stability is really important as well. And the um, again, as I mentioned, the monodispersity, and that really boils down to three areas, which are the um, core size of the um, nanoparticle, the colloidal radius, and also, as I mentioned, to this polymer surface concentration, which I'll talk in more detail about. So, what we mean by stable is that the spion size does not change over the time of interest. And so, just to tell you what we did here, so um, this is the iron oxide nanoparticle core from um, TEM from transmission electron microscopy. You can see that this is done. Um, you can get very, very small um, nanoparticles, which is what you want in order to have this super paramagnetic behavior. And so, we have created these by using thermal decomposition. You know, we've followed um, protocols um, that other others have have done, but we've we've um, basically been able to do this where you, as, as you all know, in order to have these um, nanoparticles, you have to cap them in a way. And so what we're um, also, um, as I mentioned too, in, in the design criteria, it's really important to have a strong bond for the polymer together with the nanoparticle. So for this, we use the catechol group. So, um, so this is to anchor it. Basically, you want N-tethered polymers, right? And so this is where we're using this um, P amps that other people had shown, right? But they were not able to control it N-tethered. And so to do that, um, we actually, you take these oleic acid um, capped spions, right? And then you can exchange them with citric acid um, spions. You can actually do polymer grafting um, too, but we found that it's more effective if, if you actually first exchange with citric acid. And so um, essentially um, we, we used um, ATRP to do this. So we um, made this initiator basically that you could, you know, add this to the group and then basically you can, you can either graft from or graft to. We found um, that it was better to actually make the polymer and solution and then graft to. As you'll see in a minute, um, there are challenges in terms of um, growing them and getting enough um, surface density on here. And, it, and it's, as I'll show you, it, it's going to depend on the molecular weight of the polymer. So having that in, in mind, um, 
this I want to just explain the the theory because we what we really were um, hoping to do is because with um, computational modeling you can access a much wider um, in silico space than you can in terms of doing the experiments. So this is a collaboration with Egal Schlafer at Northwestern University. So those of you may be familiar with uh, the molecular theory that they've been doing for, for many, many years, um, looking at um, you know, polymer um, uh, chains and their distributions and the, the end tethered and looking at different layers of polymers. So essentially you minimize the, the free energy um, and these are just the different components in here. This is just very simplified here. We've actually published on, on this work and I have the reference in the, the following slides. But like I mentioned, you have the electrostatics, the van der Waals, the, the chemistry, the repulsive and also the, the nanoparticle interaction. Also added in here too are the acid base kind of reactions um, in terms of seeing you know, what is protonated or not. As I mentioned, this is being conducted in this high um, salt, um, this brine condition. And so what you really are looking here at, this is the, um, this critical surface density, which I mentioned before is really important because for, for economies of scale, if you, if you um, can uh, actually know what your minimum surface coverage is required, you then don't put more polymer in and then you can save in terms of like, in terms of, um, putting these reagents down into the in, uh, downhole in terms of trying to do enhanced oil recovery. So the different curves you can see here are um, as a function of the, the radius of the nanoparticle. Um, and so what you see here, this is for different molecular weights of the polymer, um, the, you know, the segment length. And so just to give you an example, so for let's say um, um, an iron oxide nanoparticle with, with a four nanometer radius, with 55 um, uh, you know, repeat units, you would then say this should be on the order of, um, you want a minimum of 0.045, um, a minimum number of chains per nanoparticle about 14. And so, um, so this is what the, the theory was predicting. And so I'm not showing you all of, all of the experiments, just showing you the results. So this is actually, a, a, which, which was published here in Langmere, you can see that, um, for we actually did two different um, uh, surface concentrations of the PAMPs. You had uh, the PAMPs. So you had a low surface coverage and a high surface coverage. And so this here, this curve is the um, calculated curve. And so you can see that we're actually, um, in terms of uh, what our prediction is saying for this five um, uh, nanometer radius, we should be above this curve. So what we, and in fact, that's what we observe. We do not see um, any aggregation in, in um, over for a period of four days in this API brine. In contrast, right, if we then do um, uh, the, the surface coverage, um, again, high and low, but we're, we actually, in this prediction, uh, for this particular case, right, this is a different molecular weight now. This is um, half as many um, repeat units. This is 25, this was 50. And for this concentration, you can see that this is telling you that you're going to have aggregation. And so just um, kind of summarizing this in a way, what, what you essentially do is you have this input, you know what your surface um, density is going to be. You wanna know what this critical surface density is going to be. And then, so in other words, here, this is clearly above your surface um, concentration, and this is um, equal to the critical surface concentration, and this is below. And then what you, what I mentioned already before, you get this um, stable, highly singly dispersed um, nanoparticles. Around here, you start to get some um, metastable aggregation to start. And then here's where you um, really, when it's really low density, um, th this, the, the aggregates may precipitate as well. Um, so I go, moving on to the, the next topic, I want to um, take some time in explaining um, what aortic stenosis is. And, and again, this is also using the iron oxide nanoparticles. And then I'll be explaining some in vitro um, uh, test models that we use for this. But before I do that, I think it's important to um, just take a step back and see what the power is in using these superparametric um, um, iron oxide nanoparticles. Uh, as has been alluded to already, there's a lot of power that you can do in terms of detection. You can um, 
look at um, nucleic acids. You can look at, um, uh, you can functionalize these with antibodies. So you can have proteins and do sensing that way. Even looking at exosomes, which are being used more increasingly um, as the indicators of, of disease and, and just and in treatment as well in terms of therapeutics. Um, in, in targeting DNA, um, you can have different enzymes, binding of nucleic acids as well. Um, and then it just is important, it's important, especially in biomedical applications, you want to control the, um, not only the aggregation, but as we'll see, you have proteins that can be absorbing, so you want to uh, minimize the nonspecific interactions. And finally, something where, where, where I won't be able to talk about today, but we're very interested in doing, we're very interested in using cell um, separation, using these iron oxide nanoparticles for rare cell types. And so just to tell you about this calcific aortic valve disease, so this is a picture, um, just a rendering of a, of a heart, and this is the aortic valve, and this is the normal state. So your valve opens and closes, opens and closes, and, and that's when, when everything is normal. But what tends to happen is that as you, um, for, for reasons that people are still trying to figure out, your, uh, over time there can be some congenital, some genetic um, effects too. You can then have defects inherent. Calcification is one of the factors, and this can um, cause leakage and actually your valve does not work as well. And so one of the, the causes, that, as I mentioned before, some of these can be congenital. You're born with this. Um, a lot of, the, most of them are age related, so you will have this progressive calcification. Some of them are like related to rheumatic fever where you have, it's again related to inflammation. And this is the most common valvular heart disease in the aging population, actually in the United States, actually, I'm not sure about Europe, but 12.4% um, of the aging population suffers from aortic stenosis. And so to, to take that a little further, what's actually even more, tr more troubling is that the diagnosis is always usually very, very late, right? So if what you always, when you're trying to do some diagnosis, you'd like to diagnose the disease as early as possible, right? Because people have shown with, with cancer and other kinds of things, if you can do um, uh, the, the treatment, if you can detect early, there's a lot of treatments for detecting early. That is not the case for aortic stenosis. So usually sometimes you go in, they'll, they'll do some um, tests on your, uh, that, that's kind of a, um, so if you have um, your ve venous insufficiency, they, they may just kind of grab your foot and then see how quickly that recovers. You have like ultrasound that can be done, um, some, some x-ray, uh, CT as well. And then um, in the later stages, what usually ends up happening is that you have to do kind of an emergency surgery. So um, here, as I mentioned here, this SAVR is surgical aortic valve replacement. There's about 75,000 of these performed per year in the United States. There's about 25,000 done transcatheter um, in the US um, alone as well. And so again, these are ways where um, some of the solutions are you put in an artificial valve, but it would be so much better if you could try to detect this as early as possible and try to avoid this kind of late stage um, uh, treatment. So what are the earlier stages? So the early stages, let's just take a, a step back and, and look at what the disease progression is. So in early stages, you have endothelial cell disruption, as it is um, inflammation is a factor in many, many different diseases. And as you know, one of the, the kind, of, um, kind of results of inflammation is you have lipoprotein deposition and you can have these microscopic calcifications and people are still trying to figure out, um, we're learning more and more about this again as we, um, learn about this. I should mention there are no good animal models of aortic stenosis. That's why that makes it even more challenging. So the middle stages are you can have inflammation dependent calcification. You could have osteogenesis, which is basically bone formation, and then um, lesion formation can happen as well. And then in even later stages, right, these lesions, and this is a picture that, that I showed you kind of a cartoon in earlier, so this is a, the problem. You have decrease in the valve area. You don't have proper closing of the valve. And so this, this really can then um, 
lead to obstruction and the outflow. And then um, this is where the really the problem is. And then you need to go in for a valve replacement. And so um, what are the different kinds of medical imaging that's, that's um, possible for these? So there are basically three primary clinical imaging modalities. There's echocardiography, CT scan, and MRI. And so um, the reason why, um, so the echocardiography, the ultrasound, does not give you as high as resolution. And the CT scan, you have to be careful in doing, if, especially if you're thinking about doing something um, for you know, repeated, repeated diagnostics, the, uh, the exposure to the x-ray can be very damaging, right? So, so the, for those reasons, MRI has a potential um, for this. So, so in, in, um, it has a potential to be um, a modality for early detection. And so what you have, um, these MRI contrast agents, you have gadolinium, which is, these are current FDA approved uh, modalities, gadolinium and, and these super paramagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles. Um, in terms of looking at the type of contrast, so the gadolinium is positive, it's T1 weighted, um, iron oxide is T2 weighted, although um, there are potential for iron oxide to be T1 as well, as, as people are getting more of these ultra small um, super paramagnetic um, iron oxide nanoparticles. They are both um, have FDA approved products based on these, these compounds. They are, you're both able to do surface modification with these. Their um, gadolinium, many people are shifting away from using that because they have kidney and brain, you know, nephro and neurotoxicity. And so some people just cannot take gadolinium. Whereas the iron oxide, it biodegrades into iron, right? Which is, in fact, people are taking, you know, iron supplements and they're, it's being treated for anemia. So, um, so just to show you what we, um, what we would like to do is we, as I mentioned before, we want to improve the patient um, prognosis. We want to predict um, uh, where the disease is and really enable early treatments. And in, in order to do this, we, we are functionalized these iron oxide nanoparticles, and we decided to target something called hydroxyapatite because it is one of um, the main components in a valve lesion, and it's indicating indicative of ongoing active calcification. Many targeting peptides have been identified, um, usually actually through phage display is one of the, the main ways that they've been doing that. And so um, in order to do that, just to show you, and this is published work, we have, again, similar to the story I told you for the, um, the oil recovery, we can have oleic acid capped and then um, like ligand exchange for citric acid. You can add a polyethylene glycol um, coating on it. And then um, through functioning um, for different kinds of chemistry, you can then add these small peptides. So you have the hydroxyapatite binding peptide or also another peptide we were interested in at the time was osteopontin as well. And so what you see, um, something I'm, I'm only showing you a little bit of the data because you can look um, on the reference if you're interested more. Something I've talked with Sergey quite a bit about is um, whenever you inject something into the body, you have to worry about serum proteins, right? And so, um, because you'll have the corona layer that, that can form. And so indeed we see that. So this is like dynamic light scattering from um, these results. So you can see uh, there's a huge difference, right? In terms of whether you have serum proteins available um, and present and in terms of their, uh, their, their hydrodynamic radius for, for all, you know, the PEG, the osteopontin and the hydroxyapatite binding peptides. Um, something else too is, however, we see that uh, predominantly the spions ex exhibit um, selective binding in 50% serum, and this is a Prussian blue stain, and you can see that there's a lot of binding to this cholesterol, um, which is not surprising, but you can see mainly that the binding happens to these, um, the hydroxyapatite and the os osteopontin, um, but what you see slightly more binding with the hydroxyapatite. So um, I just want to, um, yeah, so, so let me, th this I'll go through kind of quickly. One thing um, is we're interested in seeing um, whether these nanoparticles can pass through um, uh, the endothelial cell layer. And so just to show you quickly, actually, maybe I should skip this because um, I'm running out of time. It's basically the, the, the upshot is that the nanoparticles can pass through the, the endothelial cells. And if anyone's interested, I can 
tell them more about it and that we as also see preferential um, uh, binding to the hydroxy appetite um, in, in this. And this happens to be with excised samples of, this is human tissue that we're able to see this. And we can verify this from the Prussian blue staining. In the last kind of couple minutes, I just want to tell you very briefly our story with these um, abdominal surgical adhesions. And so something um, you may or may not know is that whenever you have an open surgery, and that can be um, a C-section, a cesarean section, trauma, bowel reconstruction, you can have these bands of tissue that can form and cause like bowel kinks um, and small bowel disease. And so one of the things we're very interested in is in being able to detecting and treating these. And one way we're doing that is with ultrasound. So you can um, use the, have a micro bubble that will uh, allow you to image this. And the idea would be is to then use ultrasound to basically break through these adhesions. And so just in terms of the polymer part of this, we have a um, polymer lipid, um, a polydiacetylene. So when you shine UV light, this actually stabilizes the bubble. It, it turns, um, you know, it even has a color change and turns, turns pink. Um, I'll skip this. This is um, just one way how we use, make the bubbles with microfluidics. But just to show you here that this is their stability that over time, if you want to target something, micro bubbles have been used to look at um, blood, uh, blood imaging contrast. And in blood imaging contrast, you actually want the bubble to disappear within minutes. But if you're trying to do detection of these adhesions, you want them to stay around for days. And so this is what we're showing with our um, polymerized shell. Um, you, you are able to have them more stable. And, and so um, this is also showing that we can actually bind them. This is a peptide that actually binds to fibrin. And um, I think I just, just have one last slide here. This is showing, um, or, or two more slides. One is uh, showing in an animal model. So this is an ischemic button model you can see we can reproducibly form these, these adhesions. Like unlike I mentioned to you, the aortic stenosis, there is no animal model. Here we do have an animal model where we can then test our, our bubbles against this. And just to kind of finish and, and show you here, in my laboratory, we kind of merge everything in terms of like making tissue models in vitro. So this is just one example how you can see these are micro bubbles on uh, angiogenesis on a chip, which are basically blood vessels on a chip, and we have been using that to look at different kinds of cancer drugs um, uh, and, and basically putting that together and trying to assess the, the performance of these, when, especially if you don't have an, a good animal model for these. So with that, I just want to thank um, you for your attention and just acknowledge my, my collaborators and group members I've highlighted in here, 